the city of St. John's had two historic elections in the 1920s. In 1921, women voted for the first time. And in 1925, they could also run for political office. Both milestones came after a long-fought battle. Local suffragists had been working for three decades to win voting rights for women. And even when a bill guaranteeing the right to the municipal vote was drafted, it took about five years of delays and political wrangling before the government finally passed it. Newfoundland's suffrage movement began in 1890. That fall, a group of about 60 St. John's women formed a local branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The WCTU was an international organization that wanted voting rights for women. Soon, WCTU branches opened at other communities across the island. And a suffragist newspaper called The Water Lily began to circulate. The movement was gaining support, but it also faced many obstacles. Prime Minister William Whiteway opposed the movement, and so did most of his government. After Bonavista MHA Donald Morrison introduced a suffrage bill in 1892, the legislature defeated it by a vote of 13 to 10. The bill lost a second vote one year later. With the government and the mainstream press firmly against it, the suffrage movement lost momentum. But a letter to the St. John's Daily News in 1908 helped to revive the movement. No country can call itself free while one whole class is governed without representation. But it is heartening to know that be the fight short or be the fight long, the issue is not for a moment in doubt. The women's suffrage movement cannot possibly be defeated. The author of that letter was Armin Gosling. She was one of the most prominent suffragists in St. John's. Her husband also supported the movement. Gilbert Gosling was a successful businessman and president of the Newfoundland Board of Trade. In 1914, he also became heavily involved in municipal politics. That year, public dissatisfaction with the way St. John's was administered became so strong that the Newfoundland and Labrador government temporarily replaced the town's elected council with an appointed commission. Alongside governing St. John's, the commission had to draft a new municipal charter aimed at improving the town's finances and public services. The document would also formally recognize what was previously the town of St. John's as a city. Once the charter was finalized, an elected council would again take over. Gilbert Gosling was selected to lead the commission. Under his guidance, one more item was added to the agenda. Municipal voting rights for women. After about two years in office, the commission submitted its charter to the Newfoundland and Labrador government on March 28, 1916. Three months later, Gosling was voted into office as the new mayor of St. John's. Municipal elections had returned, but women were still barred from casting ballots. Gosling's municipal charter granted them voting rights, but it would take the Newfoundland and Labrador government five years to enact it into law. Several factors contributed to the delay. The First World War gobbled up much of the government's time and resources, and that was compounded by a series of political wranglings that saw five different prime ministers take office between 1916 and 1921. On August 2, 1921, the legislature passed Gosling's municipal charter. St. John's women aged 21 and older finally had the right to vote, but with limitations. Men could vote if they paid a $2 poll tax, but women only had that right if they owned or leased property under their own names. That imbalance narrowed the field of female voters considerably. Most of the women who could vote were either wealthy or widows who had inherited property. There were also about 80 working-class women who could vote because they owned their own shops. But despite its shortcomings, the legislation was historic and so was the next municipal election. 
On December 15, 1921, the first women in Newfoundland history cast ballots in an election. About 1,000 came to the polls that day. None, however, could run for political office. In order for that to happen, the municipal charter stipulated that women must also be able to run in dominion-wide elections for a seat in the House of Assembly. Fortunately, Armin Gosling and the other suffragists had been lobbying the government to do just that. Their years of hard work finally paid off on March 9, 1925, when Prime Minister Walter Monroe introduced a suffrage bill to the legislature. It passed unanimously that same day and became law on April 13. It was a timely victory for women in St. John's because the next municipal election was just eight months away. The December 8, 1925 St. John's election was the first one in Newfoundland and Labrador history that allowed women to vote and run for political office. That year, 20 candidates competed for six seats on the St. John's Council. Among them were three women, Fanny McNeil, May Kennedy, and Julia Salter Earle. McNeil and Kennedy were longtime suffragists who ran a joint campaign under the slogan, Two Heads Are Better Than One. They promised to improve social services, and their campaign literature highlighted the importance of having women in elected positions while also pointing out the many obstacles that faced them in the political arena. It is no easy matter for women to stand as candidates for the first time in our civic elections. It will be a still more difficult task if elected, but the work waiting to be done is unlimited and the need for the help of women is great and urgent. There is a prejudice to be met, and it is only by sincerity of purpose and persistency that this prejudice can be overcome. In our campaign as candidates, we find that housing, sewerage, collection and disposal of garbage, sidewalks and drains, and the inspection and handling of food to be the vital problems. These problems bear directly on the health and comfort of the homes, and the knowledge acquired through the canvassing for election should prove a future benefit to the consideration of those problems. In contrast to McNeil and Kennedy, Julia Salter Earle ran a solo campaign. She was a government engrossing clerk who prepared by hand every statute the legislature passed. Her job strengthened her candidacy because it had given her an encyclopedic knowledge of local laws. But she was even more respected for her work as a labor leader. In 1918, Salter Earle had made history when she became the first woman in Newfoundland to lead a local union, the ladies' branch of the Newfoundland Industrial Workers Association. During her three years in that role, Salter Earle had helped unemployed people find jobs and had also improved working conditions inside the city's factories and other businesses. As a result, she was popular among working class and low-income voters. During the municipal election, her slogans built upon the trust she had earned as a labor leader. She also poked fun at Fannie McNeil and May Kennedy. Both women were wealthy and had ties to the mercantile and business elite. That alienated many working-class voters who were the very people Salter Earle was trying to appeal to. In the end, though, all three of the women were defeated. Out of 20 candidates, McNeil was 13th and Kennedy 15th. Their campaign failed to resonate with voters. Worse still, their promise to improve social services caused many to worry that taxes might rise as a result. But it was a close call for Salter Earl. There were six seats that needed to be filled, and she came in seventh. Her defeat became shrouded in controversy after it was discovered that a ballot box in a key district had gone missing before the votes inside were counted. Eventually, though, the box was discovered and a recount put Salter Earl within 11 votes of victory and of becoming the first woman elected to the St. John's Council. Another 44 years would go by before that happened. In 1969, Dorothy Wyatt won her first municipal election. 
She again made history in 1973 when she won the race to become St. John's mayor. It was a position she held for two terms until 1981.